and I'll be presenting the principles of diatomy used in surgery. This is my outline. And diatomy is the use of high frequency radio wave electrical current to cut or coagulate tissue during surgery. It allows for precise incisions to be made with limited blood loss and is now used in nearly all surgical disciplines. The Greek meaning of that is through and them is heat, which means heating through. In prehistoric times, hot stones were used. The first golden era was the discovery of electricity, and the second was galvanization, um, which was discovered by Luigi Galvani in 1786, which was the use of zinc to coat um, steel or iron. The third was electromagnetism, and in 1897, Frank Nigel Smith discovered that um, and modern diatomy was discovered by Bowie and Cushing in 1926. Circuit is a pathway of uninterrupted flow of electrons, while current is the flow of electrons over time. Resistance is the obstacle to flow of current. Voltage is the force pushing current through resistance, and frequency is the number of cycles of one waveform that is repeated per second. Diatomy uses very high frequencies, around 0 0.5 to 3 megahertz of electrical current, that is about 500,000 hertz to 3 million hertz. And this allows for diatomy to avoid frequencies used by body systems generating electrical current, such as skeletal muscle and cardiac tissue, allowing for body physiology to be broadly unaffected by its use. The radio frequencies generated by diatomy hit the tissue to allow for cutting and coagulation by creating intracellular oscillation of molecules within the cells. So depending on the temperature reached, different results occur. For example, at 60 degrees Celsius, cell death occurs, that is to fulgurate, and between 60 to 99 degrees Celsius, dehydration occurs and the tissues coagulate. And around 100 degrees Celsius, the tissues vaporize, that is the cutting effect. The types of diatomy. The configuration of diatomy devices can either be monopolar or bipolar. Both actions require electrical circuit to be completed, but vary in how this is achieved. In monopolar diatomy, the electrical current oscillates between the surgeon's electrode through the patient's body until it meets the ground plate to complete the circuit. So this is the ESC generator, the electrosurgical generator, and this is the electrosurgical pencil. So the electrodes begin from here and travel through the wire to the electrosurgical pencil to the patient, goes to the ground plate. The ground plate is very important to complete the circuit and it goes back to the ESC generator. In bipolar diatomy, the two electrodes are found on the instrument itself, here and here. The bipolar arrangement negates the need for a dispersive electrode. Instead, a pair of similar size electrodes are used in tandem. The current is then passed between the electrodes. Bipolar is mostly used in operation of the digits to avoid monopolar current focused in a smaller region and is used in patients with pacemakers to avoid electrical involvement of the pacemaker. Surgical diatomy is used for cutting and coagulation. Cutting uses a continuous waveform with low voltage. In cutting mode, the electrode reaches a high enough power to vaporize the water content. Hence, it is able to perform a clean cut but is less efficient at coagulating. The cutting mode focuses heat at the surgical site, using sparks being a more focused way to distribute heat. The cutting mode should therefore be used with the tip slightly away from the tissue. Coagulation alternatively uses a pulsed waveform with a high voltage. In coagulation, the waveform is at a lower average power, not generating enough heat for explosive vaporization, but enough for thermal coagulation. The tip should be held slightly away from the tissue, however, the sparks are spread over a wider area, causing charring rather than cutting. There's also a mixed or blend mode acting in between as cutting and coagulating. However, this is not widely used. So in the mixed, in the blend mode, it has a bit of interrupted waveform. So this allows for slower cutting and coagulation at the same time. So creating tissue effect. This is the electrosurgical pencil. And you can see the yellow and the blue button. The yellow activates the cut function and the blue activates the coagulation function. So cutting mode um, has a continuous frequency with low voltage. It's not as high as the coagulation mode. And it's 100% of the time. So if you activate the cut button, 
and the surgical pencil is slightly away from the skin, it, will, it would cause um, a clean cut tissue effect. But if you come in contact with the skin, it will cause white coagulation effect. But in coag when you activate the blue button and you come and you don't go in contact with the skin, it would cause a superficial black coagulation effect. This is because the waveform is interrupted, is pulsed, and is on six percent of the time. So it gives it enough time. To, it gives enough time for the coagulum to form on the tissue to stop bleeding. And this is the blend mode that works with both cutting and coagulation. So if you have bleeding from a small vessel, which button do you activate? You think to activate the coagulate button, but instead it's actually the cut button. This is because the cut gives enough depth of penetration to fully access the vessel. And when trying to secure the vessel, it should be compressed to prevent heat dissipation by blood flow and to allow enough sealing. Preoperatively, the surgeon should have proper training and should inspect all connections and the surgeon takes overall responsibility of the procedure. And the instrument should undergo regular maintenance to avoid injuries. Intraoperative, the patient should be positioned properly and there should be adequate insulation. The dispersive electrode is the pad that is placed underneath the patient. So it should be adequate contact avoid wrinkle and keep dry. The pad should be placed close to the operating site because the further away the pad is from the operating site, the longer the circuit means you require more voltage to operate and this could result in bonds to the patient. And we should endeavor to apply the pad in bulky areas with good vascular supply. Avoid hairy areas with bony prominence and scar tissue. So we should allow the volatile solutions like spirits to dry before draping and anesthetic gases, they are very inflammable and can lead to explosions by ignition from stray current or electrode. And when changing settings on the electrosurgical generator, this should be confirmed verbally to alert everyone. And while handling the electrodes, it should only be activated when in contact or, close pro pro or in close proximity with the target tissue. The electrode tip must be visualized before activation and returned to the receiver or holster when not in use. And when activating the foot pad, the foot pad, it should be by the surgeon. The foot pad is like the ele electrosurgical pencil. It has the cut and coag button. So it should be the same person using the pencil that is activating the foot pad. And post-operatively, the patient should be inspected properly for possible bonds. 4,000 patients get bond by faulty electrosurgical devices per year. Up to 70% of bones in laparoscopic surgeries are undetected at the time of injury. 18% of surgeons have experienced electrosurgical injuries through insulation failures or capacitance coupling. Some of the mechanisms of thermal injuries include the issues associated with the, with the dispersive pad. You could have problems with the sites you miss the pad. For example, if you're operating in the pelvic region, the, the pad should be placed under the tie. And also, you could have problems with detachment, but they have a return electrode monitor on the ESC generator. It turns red when it notices that the pad has fallen off the patient and is green when the pad is still attached to the patient. You can have current diversions, example, insulation failures. So frequent use and high, frequent continuous use of high voltage can create cracks, allowing the current to injure nearby vital organs. While direct coupling is when the electrode pencil is placed at the tip of the forceps, but in this case it's a laparoscope, and the electrode passes through it into the laparoscope and injures the nearby, nearby tissue. And in capacity coupling, we have two insulated conductors. One is active and one is inactive. So you have current running in the active, which induces current in the inactive. Especially if you use high voltage, it would cause it to induce the inactive one and it could cause injury to organs that are not in your field of vision. That is if you're using a laparoscope. And this is because of the close proximity. Other injuries could be gotten through inadvertent activation, that's accidental activation of the electrode, or through continuous use of high voltage. You could have fires from volatile solutions and anesthetic gases. 
and smoke inhalation to both theater staff and the surgeon. Like I mentioned previously, capacitive coupling is more important or is more of a problem in laparoscopic surgery. In laparoscopic surgeries, insulator equipment must be used and checked regularly to ensure it is intact. Not insulated metallic equipment can post potentially create an alternative electrical pathway, so it should be kept at a safe distance from the active electrode. In capacitive coupling, when the alternative current is passed from the insulated instrument to the non-insulated insulated one through a capacitor, metallic chokers should therefore have good contact with the abdominal wall to avoid burns and non-conducting chokers must ensure they are in good condition to avoid burns. Some contraindications in diatomy use include implantable devices like pacemakers, especially in monopolar diatomy because the patients are at risk of damage from the electrical current in the diatomy. So we prefer to use bipolar where possible. If not, the, we have specialized magnets that can be placed over the pacemakers to reduce the risk to the patient. Also, patients with implantable cardiovascular defibrillator, the ICDs can interpret the diatomic current as an unstable cardiac rhythm and potentially result in the patient being shocked. Consequently, such devices need to be deactivated prior to surgery and specialist input received regarding its use. If the ICD is deactivated, the patient must have the fibrillator pads applied intraoperatively. In conclusion, radiofrequency electrosurgery is an indispensable tool in modern surgery. Adequate tra training and precautions must be observed to ensure safety to both the patient and the surgeon. What is the advantage of bipolar over monopolar and why don't we need to use a dipassive part for bipolar diatomy? The advantage of bipolar over monopolar is that we don't require a dispersive part. In monopolar, the electrodes are transferred between the these two pencils. So it doesn't require the dispersive pads to complete the circuit. When the electrode is flowing from the ESU generator, it has the circuit has to be completed. If not, it would cause bonds to the patient. But in the case of bipolar, it has a second pencil that is transferring the electrode back. Or in monopolar, it's just one pencil. So you require the pad to return the electrodes back to the generator. For bipolar, the current is that just at the tip of the bipolar. For any reason, any tissue injury to be just at that tip, where at the point, at the point where the bipolar is being attached to the tissue. The energy is between just the two tip of the bipolar, which is a very, very small mark. So there's little energy to set between the bipolar and other tissues outside the tissue, that, the tissue of concern. Unlike in monopolar, where you still have energy dissipation. So you need that energy to return back to the generator. What the difference is between electrosurgery and electrocautery? Explain something that if you want to calculate vessels, I think you care that, that you will use the cuff instead of the coag. For small vessels, yes, you can use the cutting simply because it requires a low voltage and reduces the risk of, of course, with high voltage, with high um, frequency, there is increased risk of dispersing of this um, electric to the body and tissue necrosis. And for small vessels, you can use cutting because it can also coagulate. But for larger vessels, you actually have to use the coagulation method, for, especially for vascular surgeries. So it is just preferred to use cutting just because it requires low voltage. So the risk factors or the side effects are reduced compared to coagulation. But for high, for large vessels, like for vascular surgeries, for vascular repairs, you have to use the coagulation, not cutting. Don't use mannitol for bowel preparation in a patient you'll be using diatomy for. The reason being that, that mannitol is broken down to volatile gases such as ethylene and this can lead to fire intra up um, in addition to this you want to shave the skin over where the indifferent electrode will be placed and it is everyone's responsibility to check the connections the cables and everything of the diatomy of the in, to check the diatomy system to ensure that it's functioning properly. Intraoperatively, the patient's body should not be in contact, particularly if you're using the monopolar diatomy. The patient's body should not be in contact with any metallic surface, such as the couch, the drip stand, 
or any other metallic surface around. Also, for the surgeon, you do not want to wear a ring or metallic object during surgery, particularly if that term is being used. That could cause burns for the surgeon as well. Overzealous coagulation. Sometimes you see those very dark suits on shoes really be a need use for infection. Secondary hemorrhage, poor wound healing, wound death, he says. The history of how diathermy use came about. Yes, she mentioned Bovi and Cushing in 1926. She credited them with the advent of modern diathermy. So, I mean, it's worthy of note. William T. Bovi is often credited with the invention of the diathermy unit. But actually, the German physician, I think his name was um, something Schmidt, Nigel Schmidt. He was actually the first person to coin the word diathermy from the Greek words through heat. That's in quotes, through heat. And he coined, coined that word diathermy. And yes, it uses very high frequencies, you know, of electrical current to carry out certain processes, as you mentioned, as she elaborated in the presentation. But the reason why is these high frequencies actually allows the diathermy to avoid the frequencies used by our body systems. Because we know that our body systems also generate electric current. You know, our skeletal tissue, our, you know, heart tissue, you know, they also produce electrical currents, isn't it? However, diathermy uses very high frequencies. And so because of that, you know, our body physiology is unaffected by the use of that diathermy. And you know that intracellular oscillation of molecules that diathermy produces, you know, is similar. We can just uh, imagine, you know, how, I, how the microwave works, our normal microwave oven that we use to heat up our foods. You know, you can imagine those cells being heated up, oscillating. And that is how we can imagine how the diathermy works um, in our bodies. And yes, somebody mentioned the issue of some of the precautions. Yes, a lot has been said about the precautions when using our diathermy machines. Shouldn't be placed over bony prominences, shouldn't be placed, of course, over metals, especially metal prosthesis. So remember that some of our patients have prosthesis, isn't it? So we should remember that we should, as much as possible, try to avoid placing those, the diathermy over metal prosthesis over scar tissue, over hairy tissue. If you know that the patient is hairy, you try as much as possible to shave the hair, you know, before you apply the diathermy pad. And you should also avoid, of course, your pressure points because you can actually develop, patient can actually develop a pressure injury if you apply your diathermy uh, pad over pressure areas. A burn injury that results as a result of diathermy burns. Yes, you've discovered that the patient has a burn injury probably on table when you're cleaning up the patient after removal of the diathermy pad or maybe in transit when patient is moving from the operating room to the recovery room or even maybe in transit from the uh, recovery room to the ward or even on the ward or even during your post-op rounds have you heard of the quiver before so that way the diathermy pencil can be kept in a quiver rather than on the patient or just lying around yes fantastic so that's one of the do's of di of do's of uh, principles of diathermy uh, in surgery. You should always make sure that that handpiece should be placed in a non-conductive holster when not in use. And the most common non-conductive holster that we have available in our theaters is the quiver. It's called a quiver. Yes, it's a plus. It's a non-conductive holster, usually hollow cylindrical. That's usually um, used to keep your diathermy pen in, so that <laughs> you know you. All those, other, all those other complications that could arise that we mentioned will be avoided. And we should always make sure that we use the lowest possible generator setting that will achieve you know, our desired surgical um, effect. Yes, I can see that you talked about return to the receiver holster when not in use. Use higher than necessary voltages. Those, the chances of arcing are increased. What do we usually commonly do to our monopolar electrode tip intraoperatively? It's all part of the principles the char the um the electrode as well so all those dark colored tissue that could accumulate on the electrode they are to be removed as needed exactly 
So we make sure that we clean our electrode trip, uh, tip as frequently as we can. Because we know that as the ESCA, that dead tissue from burning all our tissues is building up, you know, the, there might be increased risk of arcing, sparking, you know, ignition and flaming of that ESCA, isn't it? It can actually burn up. So we try as much as possible to clean the electrode. We hand it over to our scrub, to our scrub nurse and she, she cleans it as often as possible. It should be wiped away commonly with like a, like a sponge rather than the common scratch pad that is used to clean it off. Because if you use those scratch pads, it can make, uh, you know, like grooves into the electrode tip. And that can actually increase the ESCA uh, buildup. So those are some of the do's, you know, and uh, don'ts. And yes, uh, I think a lot has been said about the differences between electrocautery and electrosurgery. But I, I'd just like to clarify that. Somebody said that uh, electrocautery is a type of electrosurgery, but it, it is not. There are two separate distinct terminologies. So there are differences between your electrocautery and your electrosurgery. Electrocautery, first of all, you know, uses a device in which a direct current is used to heat that electrocautery probe. It uses direct current, meaning that the, you know, the electrons flow in one direction, whereas the electrosurgery uses alternating current. The one of the main differences is that in electrosurgery, the patient is actually included in the circuit and the current enters into the patient's body. While in electrocautery, that current, that direct current does not enter the patient's body. So because, of, because usually in electrocautery also, they're usually like portable, like battery powered devices that, I can, that can either be disposable or even reusable, unlike the electrosurgical uh, unit, isn't it? So those are some of the differences. Although sometimes you can see in some texts or some people use the terminologies interchangeably, electrocautery, uh, diathermy, you know, ele electrosurgery, they're actually two separate distinct uh, differences. I think the moderator talked about some of the uses of electrocautery, using it commonly in, you know, day, uh, in day case surgery, sometimes in, you know, uh, your, by your side, your clinics, dermatology clinics, to burn off some little small lesions, you know, so we use our electrocautery device, usually handheld, uh, reusable or disposable, battery powered, direct current, direct to the tissue that is, it's being applied to, unlike in electrosurgery, where you have the patient included in the circuit and the current enters into the patient's body. In electrocautery, the direct current just goes directly to the tissue that you're applying it to.